like to call to order the 24th meeting of the 2014-2015 Common Council. Would the clerk please read the quote for the day. Thank you, Mayor. There are two ways to be fooled. One is to believe what isn't true. The other is to refuse to believe what is true. Thank you. Would the clerk please call the roll for the meeting? Uh, there are 13 present. Alderman Thiel and Alderman Damro are both excused. Next, we'll move on to the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand and join me. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next, we'll move on to the approval of the minutes from our last meeting. Alderman Hammond. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move to approve. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Is there any discussion on the minutes as printed? Seeing none. Would the, all those in favor please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. There are no council appointments or no confirmation of council appointments needed today. Next, we'll move on to our program for tonight. Uh, our, uh, Sheboygan Police Department annual report is on your desk tonight and Chief Domagalski is here to give us a uh, program on that report. slide shows part one crimes um, and it's compared to the five year average so we get uh, a good view of what's going on in the city overall the five year average would show still um, for 2014 a 13% decrease in overall part one crimes versus that five year average um, if you compare 2014 just to 2015 about a 4% increase but you see we've made some huge, huge gains over the last some context to the numbers when they come up. It's it's not gonna come up. Uh, all the numbers are in your annual report. That you have. Assaults, you'll, you'll see, have um, risen over the last couple of years. And that really comes out of uh, the attention that we've put into making sure that we're properly reporting those crimes and coding them correctly as required by the federal reporting requirements of the Uniform Crime Reporting. Um, so of those assaults, you see there's 116 last year, aggravated assaults, 62% of those are domestic violence for women. Four of the 116 involve the use of a firearm, and about 50% of them are all as a factor. Additionally, 93% of those, the victim and suspect, no, no, so that's a key thing that these aren't stranger crimes, these are crimes that are people that know each other look at the robberies, we had 17 robberies. There was um, some people that really paid some attention to the robberies because of what happened late last fall when we had a, a run on them. Um, what I would tell you, if you compare that against the five-year average, you'd see that it was still down the five-year average in 2022. So we still made some good progress of that. Of those 17, five of them involved firearm. And we know that at least three of those, the firearm was either a pellet gun or a at burglaries probably our our, our brightest statistic <laughs> um, before I told you that we had 187 which was the lowest number in more than 30 years so we're, we're continuing to improve in that area I would tell you that there's more opportunity to continue to improve because when you really look at those in some detail what you see is that there's a split where about 50% of them are residences and the other 50% garages, a very small number of, of businesses, and when you look at that, 60% of those need no point of entry use. So we're talking about somebody breaking into a house, most of the time when that's happening, it's somebody leaving either a door, a window, or a garage door open, so you're providing some opportunity for that to happen. Um, thefts would be the other area. Um, thefts are about a 50% drop since 2008. Um, big slight increase about 4% last year over the year before, but still when we look at thefts, 
we're talking about 1,082 of those, 30% or a little over 300 are retail thefts. Another 20% are thefts from auto. So a little over 200, about 201 are thefts from auto. When we break those down, we find the same thing. More than 97% of those are where property is being left in plain sight and doors aren't locked or windows are open. So again, there's opportunities for improvement there. And then another 8% of those are where bicycles are taken. The next slide would be key accomplishments. So some of the things that I would, would talk to you about is some of our key accomplishments have been some of our focus on training. And we've tried to focus um, on some key areas in training to reduce um, risk and liability. Um, one of the things that I'm very proud about is uh, our work with fair and impartial police policing. So if you look on the national scene, what's going on regarding the events in Ferguson and New York and some of those we're, we're, um, are talking about police bias and, and how that's we had the opportunity in 2014 to partner with um, the Wisconsin Department of Justice to get some grant funds, and we brought um, Dr. Corey Fredell from South Florida University to Des Moines to do training of all of our supervisory staff and any supervisory staff in the county that wanted to attend on fair and impartial policing. So teaching us about police bias, how it manifests itself, itself in our work, and those things that we can do to train our officers so that we can um, try to minimize bias in our policing. <clears throat> so I had talked to you a little bit about that last year and that 2013, we put all our supervisory staff to it. Last year, again, we took um, advantage of uh, an opportunity from the federal government and sent two of our supervisors um, to a training that Dr. Fidel put on and trained the trainers. And so they were able to come back and we put the rest of the department, so all of our officers do that same training. So our whole department has been, been trained in this. Um, recently, um, Director Comey, who's the FBI director, gave a big speech on how we in law enforcement can improve, and one of the things that he talked about was the need for this um, training on bias. And so we're one of less than 100 departments in the entire country that have put their whole department through this. So we're really ahead of the curve in that area. Another area that we've been working on um, for about five years is on crisis intervention training. So I'll talk a little bit about the mental health system um, on the next slide. But uh, one of the things we have to do is look how we can try to minimize risk. And so in 2014, we put 17 of our personnel, so about 20% of the department, through crisis intervention training. It's a 40-hour course, so it's a huge commitment on our part. Really. Uh, idea behind that is a couple different things. It teaches officers more about mental health so that they have the awareness and they have the ability to recognize it. Um, they learn about what resources are available in the community so when they come in contact with these people they have a better opportunity to make um, good referrals so we can have better outcomes. And then lastly it teaches probably the most important thing is, is de-escalation skills. Um, one of the issues that we have is that um, in their defense and arrest tactics they're training essentially to escalate situations depending on what's happening with the subject that they're engaging. They use those same skills that they're trained on when they're dealing with people in, in their homes. So we typically want to train our outcomes. So this is really a reversal of some of that training and puts us in a, in a better situation so that they can recognize that the people have mental illness and then use these other skills so that they can de-escalate situations. With your help, one of the things that we were able to do last year was convert one of our fish uh, positions to establish a crime analyst and to a hearing software. So all of our um, interventions and our operations are really driven by data and information. These two things really help us have better information and, and more in real time so that we can be more effective in putting our people in the right places and getting them to pay attention to the right people. Um, over the last year, we were able to update our policy manual. If anybody sees it, it's about that big, so it's quite a big thing. But again, it's a risk management thing and getting best practices um, put in place. And then as part of that, we were also able to establish a, a daily training bulletin so that they're constantly going over the policy so that they can know where to head. We were able to update our squad video sy system um, to lead with for, for both better propagations and more transparency so that students 
specific things that I would like to hit on is our increased community outreach, particularly with youth, and we'll see a bunch of that in the book, but we have a Junior Police Academy, we've expanded the Explorer program. more than 10% of our department that's involved in the Lunch Buddies program, so getting the, the officers and the students at lunch with youth who really need good role models and some support in their life. And that's probably been one of the most positive things. And then additionally, we've established a um, really good relationship with the Neighborhood Leadership Academy and our neighborhood officer, so that she's involved in um, their classroom at least. And then the last, last thing we're all Educational talks to over 13,000 uh, residents, and um, the same kind of talks to over 5,000 students this past year. And the last slide talks about key threats. <coughs> key threats, as I see them from the police perspective in the community, and they're not police department problems, they're really community problems because um, they impact on everybody and the impact on the safety of our citizens and the quality of life in our community. You've heard me talk to you about it many, many times. The two big issues are mental health and mental health resources in our community and drug and alcohol abuse in our community. It's, I mentioned it before on how it impacts our violent crime, but it's really the two biggest issues that, that we deal with. Um, so I don't want to stand up here and be a naysayer. We've had a lot of progress in the community on these two issues in the, in the last year, and so I'd like to point out some of the positive things that are going on. Had excellent partnerships, and I'm happy to say that some people have really stepped up and take leadership roles in our community, and they need to be recognized for that. Number one, I recognize Tom Engelbrecht from the Bowling County Health and Human Services. He's been a terrific partner. He's been open to shifting resources when we have issues. Um, he's worked with us over the past couple of years to try to line up resources so that we can um, put on the crisis intervention training that I talked about. And next year, when I'm up here, I'll be telling you that in February, this past February, we put um, the rest of our entire department through that training. And part of it was um, due to Tom and his department's health, as well as many of the other organizations such as Mental Health America. Another big part of that, again, is trying to find those uh, resources and provide them to the community. And there's been many people who have stepped up to really try to fill the gaps that are there. Two of them that I think um, are really worthy of mentioning because um, what the future is going to look like it's, it's going to be much different because of them. One of them is Aurora because of the fact that they're already present in our community and provide mental health services both inpatient and outpatient to both adults and children. Without them we could be like many other communities and really have no options but very lucky to have them. But even more important of that is that they recognize that there's still a need and with the help of Acuity and a bunch of other partners have really stepped forward uh, to try to um, put forth even more services through a behavioral wellness program. Um, Lakeshore Community Healthcare, again, is a great asset that um, really has come from the community and is helping to address many, many of these issues. And then lastly, some of the things that you really should know is that um, CJAC, which is the Criminal Justice Advisory Committee, has been doing a lot of work around these, some of these same issues, um, trying to address some of the gaps, and, and there's different communities working on one of them, uh, one of the issues, which is a drug court. So there's a good core group of people that are working to try to find the resources and grants to apply for to bring a drug court to the community. So I think those are all really positive things that are going on around the issues. Chris, thank you very much for that report. We appreciate everything that uh, you and your fellow officers do, and it's good to see the progress that's been made in the last year. Next, we'll go on to public forum. City Clerk. Um, first, <coughs> on, Excuse me. first on our list tonight is Tammy Robb. Tammy, are you here? If you'd like to come up to the podium, please. Can I have your home address, please? So my name is Tammy Rob. I live in Home address is 1024 North Wind Forest Road in Detroit. 
and you will have five minutes. Um, I'd just like to recap some of the responsibilities on here relative to field C and cities as well as our alpha person. <coughs> the goal of the city of Sheboygan is to represent the, res the residents of the city of Sheboygan as a leg legislative body responsible for following the governing policies of the city that determine the website. Your job is to work co uh, cooperatively with the mayor and the city administrators to ensure that tax dollars are responsibly spent and that all residents have access to the services and programs that make this a, the urban living safe, affordable, and desirable. Interestingly, please explain how we are representing our neighborhood. And I have a few things down here. When our elder person hang up the phone and do not want to talk with us, they do not listen to our concerns regarding field of green. Secret, secretive meetings have been held at the last 17 months of Aurora and Mr. Haddonfield. Is this good communication? And most interestingly, share tax, share total tax their costs, budget and timeline, specifically regarding the field of green. We have seen nothing, and there's nothing posted online. This should have an open book, shared and printed with all the papers and posted online for all taxpayers to view and provide info. I have not seen any of these reports, and the city takes home business days to provide such things if you've been working on it for 17 months. Throughout the field of green field, we have been shocked from the very beginning. We are not angry, we are shocked. Our neighborhood teams have researched almost every angle and we're, we're just behind Rowan's foot every step of the way. We have also presented more than 15 land sites that Aurora could build on, located in the north, central, and southern parts of the city of Sheboygan. Why would, it, why would Aurora want to throw away $2.7 million to relocate an established soccer and baseball field? Why relocate to Long Society Gardens? Why place the burden on everyone? Why should the school district lease back the West and East parcels? Why was this secret to the public until we found it and brought the report to light? If Aurora truly was a team player, they would have considered all the properties listed on the printed agenda that have been shared numerous times. And here's an interesting fact that I learned at 4 o'clock today. If the competitor's charges are $169 per office visit, why would Aurora's charges for the same office visit be $350? math every 15 minutes over a period of a year that's millions of dollars perhaps that's why they have 2.7 to hand away i'm not sure <coughs> interestingly the schuster property by shopco is another example the land is for sale aurora was looking to purchase it a few years ago i've seen plans in addition now another company wants to buy it it has 80 developmental acres on the property although 50 acres appear to be financially viable for development it's selling for two million dollars along with $169,000 that's already spent for the fill and work. Could Aurora do a handshake deal on this property too, like the field of green? There's no sense to break up the wetlands, small forests, and open fields, just like the field of green. This property is smack dab in the center of the city and for Aurora to have easy access to Highway 23, 43, and 50. There are no railroads to discuss. There are no problems, to, uh, any concerns. So why should this not have been a consideration? We looked at it for many years. Mr. Radner, we've learned a lot from your organization over the past few weeks, and we are not liking what we're verifying. You should have been fair to us and should have shared true statements throughout this ordeal. For someone making over $293,000 a year without bonuses, is there an underlying objective on what you're working on? Perhaps we should sit down and have that discussion. Um, if the other 15 properties presented will not work, why? We've been asking that question for, for months. If Field of Dreams was number six on your list of purchase over the last four or five years, why did you purchase three of <coughs> sites in Sheboygan on the south side, and now you want to purchase the Field of Dreams? What happened to the other two sites? Why did they fall off your list? Do you have too much money to give away? If so, give it to the local organization. Is Aurora a cash cow and you just don't know what to do with your money? Let us know and we will help you. Why didn't you share with the neighborhood your DNR request last summer? Why did these secretive things come up almost a year later? Also, coaching the employees. Um, the last few months, we've been going to meetings, we've been keep te keeping tally, and we have coached. Over 11 people have presented on behalf of Aurora, where they were employees, and only two independently have come to the forefront and said they don't like this, or they're in favor of it. We have had more than 11 independent people, not coach, come up and share their discussion and their feelings as to why not to sell the field of dreams. 
So these one-on-one -on -one meetings that have recently been going on, I have not received a call. I would love to have a meeting with the Ace and Talent and the new players. Excuse me, Tammy. Your time is up. Okay. Thank you very much. Next on the list is Scott Lewandowski. Scott, can I have your home address, please? Sure. sure. Scott Lewandowski, 2201 Erie Avenue. And you will have five minutes. I'm here to speak tonight not about the $3 million plus that the city taxpayers will be stuck paying to replace what the kids and taxpayers already have, which I have spoken about in the past, but about the sneaky way things have been done. According to today's Sheboygan Press, the city knew about the plan to destroy the Field of Dreams five months ago in November, but it did not become public until last month. Then it was going to be voted on by the school board the next day, February 10th, with the city planning on voting on it the following week. Aurora was given at least five months to convince the city that this plan was good. But the people of Sheboygan were only given one day by the school board and one week by the city to raise questions. What is being hid that is tried to be rushed through? Why hasn't Aurora held a meeting to answer the community's questions? It's only little bits and pieces. The tax benefits that Aurora will pay have been mentioned. If we are willing to look at this with an open mind, we all know Aurora will not leave the city of Sheboygan, so the city will still get that tax money no matter where they build in the city. Some aldermen have been meeting with Aurora in private meetings, one on one, for as long as it takes. But for the group trying to save the field of dreams, the city gives them three minutes and doesn't ask any questions like you do to leaders from Aurora. And if Aurora says something, we can't follow up. If this is such a good thing for the city, why the secrecy? We have been told by Aurora that this is the only site that works for them. Why is it the only site? What are the reasons that other sites don't work? Aurora is not willing to answer these questions. A good company would figure out how to make those other sites work, some of which they have already purchased the land for. Instead, they are trying to divide the city just as they are doing by meeting with some aldermen one-on-one -on -one in private. Instead, Aurora is destroying the respect they have in the community. This is not just neighbors trying to stop the fuel of dreams from being destroyed as claimed, but people from all over the city. I'm not a neighbor to the fuel of dreams. I live about a mile and a half away. We have been told that the new field will be even better than what the kids have now. How do we know that? What assurance do we have? from Aurora, the Sheboygan Area School District, and the city, that everything planned will happen. There is not enough money for everything that is planned. New York City has a beautiful park in the city and financial problems, but they have never sunk so low as to sell off and destroy their central park. Why should Sheboygan sink so low as to sell a park when the city has so much other land available to build on? Finally, I will give each alderman the same offer Aurora has given you, and some of you have accepted. I will be glad to meet with any of you one-on-one -on -one, to discuss my concerns and the concerns of the Save the Field Dreams group. Other members of the group are also willing to meet with you, either one-on-one -on -one or as a group. Be fair and honest and give both sides equal time to hear both sides of the issue. Don't be narrow or closed-minded and only listen to one side. You were elected to represent the people and make the best decision possible after looking at both sides of a question instead of, instead of only one side, like some of you are doing now. If you want to take me up on my offer to meet with me one-on-one, -on -one, my phone number is 452-5709 or email me at sheboyganhistory at bitehead.com. I repeat, 452-5709 or Sheboygan History at Bitehead.com. Thank you. Thank you. Next on the list is Melissa Brash. Is Melissa here? Hmm? <laughs> Melissa, can I have your home address, please? 
it is. Can't hear. It's not. Do you want to use mine for now? I'm attached, but at least you okay. If you don't mind standing over here more. Does that, that is. Okay. Shall we go down one? Can you hear me now? Okay, we will have five minutes. All right. How should I do this? Okay, um, Sue, and I'll take my extra minute too. I know I'm going to use it. So I won't get everything in your packet tonight, but I'm going to get as much as I can. Um, first in your packet of information, I gave you an email that I sent to the city clerk, which I believe she included in your packet, but it regards the um, conflict of interest that we have with Common Council President Don Hammond. The public perception... I'm talking about any individuals here. I'm sorry, you have to eliminate that okay. from your discussion. Um, so... I just wanted to let you know that that is inside of your packet of the conflict of interest there. Good, that'll save me some time. All right, so what else is in your packet? Um, some people have said that the city of Sheboygan shouldn't be involved in the business of the city school district, um, but how the school district serves the city is managed and their decision directly impacts the city, the residents, and our children. So I'm going to talk about another financial impact, the city and the taxpayers, and ultimately our children when it comes to the decision to sell the Field of Dreams. Um, and I'll end my time with a proposal that will do just the opposite and um, propose a win-win-win for the city. So I want to call your attention to a couple things in your packet. First of all is your purchase agreement. Um, you have that. That is the purchase agreement between the school district and Aurora. This is the final copy. Um, they're working on getting the final copy signed right now, and we'll be getting a copy of that. But I wanted to point you to page 9. Um, number 24 it mentions that Aurora will, will um, take the construction uh, and the costs and expenses of the athletic fields on the East Parcel. What it doesn't mention, ooh, now it's, are we working? Sure. Um, what it doesn't cover is the most expensive part, which is the disposal of the contaminated land. Um, and that is a huge expense. And just because Mr. Grabner said um, he was going to cover the cost, it is not in writing. Um, so that is not binding. And who's going to pay for that cost? Um, and ultimately, the taxpayers pay for the school district um, as well as the city. So there's nothing in here about the uh, contaminated land on the east parcel and who's going to pay for that. I have requested that information um, from Joe Sheehan and he says he doesn't have that information because Aurora is doing the building on the east parcel. But that is, pub that is school property. He should have those numbers. Um, so I will you should probably think about requesting those, but I will be requesting them again. We should have those numbers. If that East Parcel is staying in the school district, um, we should have those numbers. Also in that same handout on number 25 under the donations, it talks about that Aurora is actually only giving to the Boots and Property $2.233 million. That's $63,000 less than they said. So that cost is going to have to be covered by the city of the Sheboygan and the taxpayers. So moving on, and you can read the rest of this, um, but they're only going to contribute the $2.233 million, and they said whatever's left over has to be covered by the city, and they're not going to cover it. But you can read the rest of that for yourself. You also have in here a packet... Um, as well as the total actual cost for phase one. 
you will notice that the actual cost for phase one for the Bootson complex is 4693000 That means that we're short $1,659,897, including the eight, not including the $800,000 that you've committed. So if we build the property with the money that the $3.1 million, we will not have concessions or restrooms. We won't have lighting for the parking lot or the drives. We will not have topsoil and drainage for each field. There'll be no landscaping. That's right here in black and white. I gave you a copy of the, of the estimation given to us by Rettler Corporation. So we are over... $1.7 million short, and that includes the, that does not include the $800,000. So, I also gave you a DNR handout as well that you can read with the DNR discussion, but we won't have time to cover that, so you can read that for yourself. So, like I said in the beginning, there is a solution to all of this. Aurora has never stated that $5.1 million donation is conditional upon building over the Field of Dreams Park. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so again, Roar has never stated that the $5.1 million donation is a condition upon building over the Field of Dreams Park. If they did, that would be a bribe and not a donation, according to the de definition. So if it is a donation, let's look at the actual win-win-win here. Aurora stated they are committed to building in the city of Sheboygan. So they will get a new outpatient surgery center and the city will collect the estimated 200000 in property taxes no matter where they build in the city. They could build on one of the two or three new properties they own, or better yet, they can buy one of our commercial properties that are for sale. Any new jobs that may be created as a result of um, and aren't transfers from the current surgery center will occur regardless of where they build in the city. Also, no matter where they build in the city, it will decompress the current clinic and hospital campuses. As Mr. Graber stated in his email that he sent out to the acuity employees, um, that were sent out to the acuity employees on his behalf. Here's the good part. Since Aurora won't be building on one of our parks, they can give the whole $5.1 million to develop the Boots and Property, and we can actually do it. And my time is up. So that is a win, 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 win for the city. Thank you. Next on the list is Renee Rush. Renee, could you come on up, please? All right, Renee Roosh, 2301 North 34th Street, Sheboygan. Five okay, thank you. Um, just to be certain that I am against the rezoning of 3306 Salmon Avenue, also known as Field of Dreams. Uh, I hope that you keep an open mind as you hear the different things that we have brought to light. I do want to, as Scott pointed out, that this is a community issue. This is not just a neighborhood issue. And the reason why I state that when, you know, giving a few examples, when Sheridan Park wanted to be built up or built over for the police department, it was a community issue. It wasn't just the neighborhood. When Taylor Drive was to be taken through Maywood, it was, it was stopped. That was not just a neighborhood issue. It was a community issue. Um, this, too, is. And if you read or have read the Sheboygan Press as of late, you've seen a lot of letters for and against it, but a lot of letters that have been against it are not just from our neighborhood. A lot of those names I don't even recognize. I don't know who they are. Um, so that kind of gives you a little bit of clue as to this, just not 30-some neighbors, okay? Um, I'm constantly stopped outside of my neighborhood where I work or at my church and, and told about how people are not happy about this. Many of them are the elderly. When they're at birthday parties or retirement parties, it's a, it's a concern that comes up and then people have talked to me like, oh yeah, this is a big talk. So I'm just trying to point that out that it's not just us that see this. 
Um, I'd also like to, you know, looking at the city, as Melissa pointed out, you know, do we have all this extra money, an extra million dollars to throw at the extra cost that is going on? Um, I would like to see that extra money, if we have it, put towards fixing our roads. We do have the worst roads I think I've ever seen or driven on. The only ones that have been comparable to me have been in Mitchell, South Dakota, where the Corn Palace is. Um, I'm not trying to slam the Public Works Department because I know that they are doing the best they can, but because of budget constraints and um, you know manpower, they, they had to lay some people off or cut hours. I get that they're doing the best they can. I just wish we could find extra money in our budget to fix those roads. Um, you know, you want to attract tourism. You want to attract people to the city. We need to maintain and, and keep what we have instead of building more, building new, building something else. You know, it doesn't do us any good if we have a great facilities but crappy roads to drive on. Just trying to point that out. Um, the garbage fee is another example of poor money management. That was supposed to be finished in December 2012, but it hasn't. And why hasn't it? Because we've needed that money to help plug the holes in our budget. And I'm not saying that, I, you know, that extra few bucks is not killing me. I get that. But it's just the promise that it was supposed to be a brief one-year thing, and it's, it's going to be there forever. We all know that. Um, just trying to point out who will pay for the upgrades to the roads once the construction trucks have come and gone. Who will do that? Who will take care of paying for the easement, the sidewalks, and all the other things that need to be put in place before the boots and property can be built upon? We were told that the city will take up and, and pick up that tab. I'd like to also point out, you know, you're looking at building on the east side. You have to, um, I'm very concerned about the safety of the children. Um, on the west side, we do not have to cross Taylor Drive right now. The kids on the north and the west side of Taylor can access the park facilities no problem. The children on the east side of Taylor have Cleveland Park and Grace Park that they can access. They don't need to cross Taylor Drive. Have you ever tried to cross Taylor Drive on your foot? I mean, like by standing on the corner and waiting for cars to go by. I have many times, I run through the area, I have to wait there a lot of times to cross without any lights, without any, um, you know, I, any, any crossing, you know, lights, or I talked about a footbridge being put on. I don't know what's going to happen, but I do know that children are impatient, and if they're waiting there at the corner, and there's no lights, there's no safety issues, or no safety nets put there, they are impatient, they cannot gauge how fast a car is coming, they can't figure this out, they see their friend over there, they're going to dart out. And it just makes me sick to think that something could possibly happen to one of our, our children. Um, I just want to also point out that this, this is a sacred area for us, for me. Um, I get that. I get that it's not sacred for everybody, but it is to me. I purposely purchased my house because it was down from this field, from the park. Where I lived in Monroe, Wisconsin, I lived across the, feet, across the street from a park, and when I was moving here, I looked in various different communities, Plymouth, Howard's Grove, I, worked, I looked at Kohler and Oostburg and Sheboygan, and this was the only facility, this was the only house that had my requirements of being close to and accessible to a park. So I just wanted to point that out as well. Lastly, um, if I could have an extra minute, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, just wanted to point out Optimus Park a few years back. Soccer fields were put on there. And um, when those were put on there, I have um, friends that live in that area. And it, with the disruption of, of the topsoil, the drainage, all that, they had a lot of water issues in their basement. And it took the city three years to get that fixed. Um, they have spent over $7,000 of their own money putting drainage systems in to get their house fixed so that the water will not seep into their basement. And there is a concern that if it is built on Field of Dreams, what will happen to the flooding and then the waterways that will go into our basement because we've already flooded out back in 98 as many of the areas in there. I'd like to add that, you know, I'd like to see this rezoning of the Field of Dreams put up for a referendum and let the people of Sheboygan decide if this should happen. I'd like to see them put it up for a vote. And lastly, I'd like to say the tagline on the bottom of all the Field of Dreams letters that went out 20-some years ago said, make our Field of Dreams for tomorrow's children come true.
I'm doing okay. Okay, Terry, I need your home address, please. 3729 South 11th Street. And you will have five minutes, sir. Can you reach the mic, oh. okay? I'm a little taller. Okay. Do you want to go down one step? There we go. Can you hear me? Okay, we're good. So, uh, my name is Terry Miller. Um, be transparent. I do work for Aurora. Um, but what I would like to talk to you about is economic growth and the current plan for the Field of Dreams. It's to enhance our sports facilities, not to destroy our, for our sports facilities. So this weekend, I have a 13-year-old girl and an 18-year-old girl. We were at a volleyball tournament this weekend uh, in a community, and there were 51 teams in my daughter's bracket. Totally shocked and amazed. Ten girls on each team. Think of that for families. We ourselves spent two nights in a hotel, total of three days in that community. We as a family spent $600. $600 times 510 just in her bracket. Okay. As I read our paper, and I don't read the paper a lot, to be honest with you, I see businesses closing. I see economic downturn. DNM, Sears, very fine. This plan to enhance our sports facilities will give us the chance to have tournaments here on weekends. 7.30 at night, I had to wait a half hour just for a table at a restaurant. I want you to really think in the future. I came here 22 years ago because I thought this was the best city for my family. In order for this to maintain, that being the best city, it has to grow. We have to have these facilities to in order to have this type of economic growth. I was totally amazed at the economics of just one girls volleyball tournament, what that could bring to a community. Imagine <coughs> what our new sports facilities, enhanced, not destroyed, could bring to our city. That's it. Okay, next we'll go on to the mayor's announcements. Today we're going to uh, help uh, the Rotary Clubs of Sheboygan celebrate their 110th anniversary. I have a proclamation I'd like to read from the Office of the Mayor of the City of Sheboygan Proclamation. Whereas Rotary International was founded on February 23rd of 1905 in Chicago, Illinois, and the first Rotary Club of Sheboygan was established in 1916, it, and is the world's uh, first and one of the largest not-for-profit humanitarian service organizations with 1.2 million Rotary Club members comprised of professional <coughs> and business leaders in early, over 34,000 clubs in 200 countries, with two clubs in Sheboygan comprising 150 members. And whereas the Rotary motto, Service Above Self, inspires members to provide humanitarian service, encourage high ethical standards, promote goodwill and peace in the world, and funding to support projects and sponsor volunteers with community expertise to provide medical supplies, health care, clean water, food production, job training, and education to millions in need, particularly in developing countries. Rotary in 1985 launched Polio Plus and spearheaded efforts with the World Health Organization, U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, UNICEF and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to immunize the children of the world against polio, which caused polio cases to drop 99% since 1988, and the world stands on the threshold of eradicating the disease. And to date, Rotary has contributed more than $1 billion in countless volunteer hours to the protection of more than 2 billion children against polio in 122 different countries, providing much needed operational support, medical personnel, laboratory equipment, and educational materials for health workers and parents. Rotary supports programs that strengthen the capacity of our community to provide basic education and literacy to all and invests in our local parks and community facilities to improve the quality of life in Sheboygan. And whereas the Sheboygan Rotary Club and the Sheboygan Early Bird Rotary Club actively sponsor service projects that address such critical issues as poverty, hunger, health, illiteracy, 
the, envir the environment in Sheboygan and throughout Sheboygan County and abroad. I, Mike Vandersteen, Mayor of the City of Sheboygan, do hereby proclaim March 15th through the 21st of 2015 as Sheboygan Rotary Week and encourage all citizens to join me in recognizing Rotary International for its 110 years of service to improve the human condition in local communities and around the world and recognize these Rotary Clubs. Uh, Kristen Blanchard from the Sheboygan Rotary Club is here and Greg Liebig. I ask you to come forward and accept this proclamation. Weninger in the audience. Okay, then the last item is that uh, the Mayor's Neighborhood Leadership Cabinet will be meeting at the Mead Public Library tomorrow evening uh, at uh, 6.30. If you can join us, we'd appreciate it. Next, we'll go on to hearings. Uh, the first uh, hearing is uh, a hearing that's scheduled this evening regarding the assessment for improvements of concrete paving in South 23rd Street from Crocker Avenue to Washington Avenue. Is there anyone wishing to be heard for that hearing? Is there anyone wishing to be heard? Is there anyone wishing to be heard? Alderman Hammond. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Move to close. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. All those in favor of closing the hearing, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Next, we'll move on to a second hearing, a hearing uh, scheduled this evening regarding levying special assessments for the calendar year of 2014 against all properties benefited in parking district number one, two, four, and five. Is there anyone wishing to be heard? Is there anyone wishing to be heard? Is there anyone wishing to be heard? Alderman Hammond. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move to close. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> Motion passes. Then we'll move on to the consent agenda, which will include items 3.2 through 3.25. Alderman Hammond. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move to accept and file all, all ROs, accept and adopt all reports of committees, and pass all resolutions and ordinances. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. That uh, Those documents are before us. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk call the roll for passage? Thirteen eyes. Motion passes. Next is communications. Item 4.1. Uh, will be referred to the Public Protection and Safety Committee, and 4.2 will also be referred to the Public Works Committee. Under reports of officers, 5.1 is an RO by the city clerk submitting a communication from Melissa Brash regarding issues that she has with Alderman Hammond about selling the Field of Dreams and the pending rezoning of the property by the Common Council. Alderman Carlson. Thank you, Mayor. I would like to make a motion to file, and I understand Alderman Ham Hammond has a statement, and I also have a statement to read, too. Second. Is there a motion and a second? The item's on the floor. Uh, Alderman Hammond, under discussion? Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Since that microphone's not working, I'll uh, please forgive my back to you in the back. Um, first, I'd like to address the correspondence from Ms. Brash, um, and I apologize if I mispronounce your name, alleging unethical conduct uh, on my part with respect to the Field of Dreams proposal. My response is multifaceted. First, I'll address the factual basis for the allegations. Ms. Bresch alleges that I have a conflict of interest in this matter on the basis of assertions that are factually inaccurate. First, it is contended that I'm a member of the Aurora Plan Giving Council. That council has not existed since 2009. Therefore, I obviously cannot be a member of a non-existent council. When it did exist, the sole purpose was to encourage charitable donations through plan gifts for the health care in, in, the in the Sheboygan community. Let me be further clear, I did not search out Aurora on this project. They approached the city because of the need for property to relocate the fields and the various zoning issues involved with their pro uh, project. This did not occur 17 months ago. It occurred a few months ago. 
It is further contended that I made a personal donation to help fund the start of Sheboygan's only neonatal intensive care unit, or NICU, that I have a conflict of interest. I did not benefit personally or financially from this donation, unless, of course, one considers gaining personal satisfaction in knowing that babies born with serious health issues can now be treated in Sheboygan without having to endure the difficulties, inconvenience, and cost of attaining such treatment in Milwaukee or Green Bay as a conflict of interest. I do not believe any applicable ordinance or rule has reached such an interpretation. If such, I, would, I dare say we will find it difficult to find public officials who have not donated to causes for whom the governing organization has not had some involvement with local government. Let me be clear, I have no formal role or association with Aurora. My involvement in the field of dreams matter has not and will not provide me any substantial benefit, let alone any benefit. My family certainly will not gain any such substantial benefit, let alone any benefit. Indeed, my efforts on this issue, which have been motivated solely by making a decision in the best interest of all of the city's citizens of Sheboygan, have involved a huge investment of time and energy and does not warrant the numerous accusations made above and beyond the merits of this matter. Additionally, it's contended that I have no authority, uh, quote unquote, to negotiate. It has been, it is currently and has been common practice for staff, mayors, and council leadership to be involved in the negotiations of development opportunities. In my time on the council, I've been involved in many development opportunities and many have been successful, adding hundreds of jobs and millions in new development to our city. In each project, meetings were held, to design, meetings, uh, meetings were held which were designed to determine the viability, the process and financial implications, if any, of the project prior to bringing the opportunity to the council for uh, further discussion and ultimately a vote. Indeed, as, it, as is well known, Section 1985 of the Wisconsin Statutes allows for the Council to meet in closed session for the purposes of discussing development opportunities. In all such meetings on the Field of Dreams projects, no commitments binding the Council were made or applied. There's no conflict of interest, and the allegations that I have not adhered to the proper rules of conduct by an elected official are without factual basis. But there's another aspect to these allegations I feel compelled to address. I would submit these, these allegations are really part of an all too common trend in our political environment to make personal accusations and allegations above and beyond the merits of the matter in discussion. Not once prior to the written statement sent out by Ms. Bresch did she contact me to ask about her concerns regarding the potential conflict of interest. Indeed, to this date, no effort has been made to contact me and confirm the accuracy of their allegations. It almost seems that the purpose of these attacks is not to assist in furthering this body's ability to make the best informed decisions, but rather to seek ways of discrediting and bullying individuals that disagree with their position so that they will not participate in the vote on this issue. Additionally, I certainly hope that our public decision-making process and discourse has not come to the point where charitable contributions, contributions made by an official for the sole purpose of bettering the community is unethical or to quote, lacking in moral principles. Over the years, I, like others on this body, have made donations of time and money to charitable organizations such as the United Way, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, Military Families, Connect the Wounded Warrior Project, the Salvation Army, Meals on Wheels, Sheboygan Rotary Foundation, American Cancer Society, Ducks Unlimited, Church, Boy Scouts, Sheboygan Food Pantry, Rebuilding Together, LTC, the YMCA, and the Girl Scouts, just to name a few. My wife and I have done all of this not for personal gain, but in hopes of helping our community. I do not believe the definition of lacking in, mor in moral principles includes charitable work. I do not apologize for making these donations of time and talent, and for you on the council, no sh nor should you. After 11 years in the United States Army, years serving on boards and committees too numerous to count and the desire to see the community be better, I ran for office as an alderman. I can certainly tell you, as many of you know and experience, so proper, properly serving as an alderman involves a commitment of time and resources and is not always easy on your family or work life. Interestingly, in all the time and of all the votes I have made, popular or unpopular, on all these boards and committees, I've never been accused of lacking in moral principles. In all the public meetings we've had on this issue, I believe my comments clearly show that my only concern was making a decision that benefited the citizens of Sheboygan as a whole. In my time as older person, we have taken up many issues, some popular, some not. However, in most cases, people have conducted themselves with integrity and respect. 
This cl is clearly not occurring with, the, with some at this time, with this matter, and with these allegations. I support this project because the project will benefit our children by providing new and better facilities, because it'll generate 200,000 plus in new tax revenue for Sheboygan, and because it'll allow the most vulnerable in our community to continue to get the services they need. Those are the only reasons. I gain nothing more from the approval of this project other than knowing that these, those goals have, uh, have been accomplished. Whether it was Aurora or another hospital system proposing this project, I would support it for the same reasons. I stand before you with a clear conscience in the statements I've just made and trust in your judgment. I would, I would res respectively submit that these allegations are meritless and that we return to a professional, vigorous, and full discussion of the merits of the proposal put forth by Aurora. Thank you for your time. Thank you for those comments. Alderman Van Akron, there's light on for you. Do you yes. have any Thank you, Mr. Mayor. discussion? I don't Thank know you. if Alderman Carlson had a, a comment yet to follow or you'd like me to go. Did you? I do, yes. Do you want to yield to him then? Uh, yes. Okay, go ahead, Alderman Carlson. And this is also in response to the, um, the letter and the allegations. I believe this le letter is fueled by two things. Uh, the first of which is passion, and that I can understand. We all need to be passionate about something. However, it is also fueled by a misunderstanding of how things really work. Leaders at every level, whether they are part of the local school board, the city council such as this, nonprofit boards, and even up the corporate ladder, are expected to help develop and move the vision of their organization forward. Part of this responsibility is to take part in meetings in order to set the groundwork for their respective governing bodies. It would be near impossible for a governing body as a whole to negotiate any deal from start to finish. It's not feasible, nor is it practical. As for the supposed ethics violations referred to in this letter, I believe it, it is just way off base. The Sheboygan Press even quoted the state statute as it pertains to ethics. It goes as follows. No public official may use their position in a way that produces or assists in the production of a substantial benefit, direct or indirect, for the official, one or more members of the official's immediate family, either separately or together, or an organization with which, which the official is associated. And as clearly stated uh, just a few seconds ago, there is no connection. It's quite absurd to believe that donating to a charity can be twisted to fit into this statement. The author of this complaint also states that he has a personal bias when it comes to this project. Even if this were true, it's a bit naive to think that we, we all as aldermen do not have some sort of bias towards this community. We all have ties to businesses, charities around the city, and I, I will admit that one of my personal biases is towards public safety. I make it a mission in my life to preserve the protective services in our city based on over a decade of service in the military. <coughs> the supporters of this project, which include Alderman Hammond and myself, among others, are looking at the entire scope of this project. The added tax revenue of the medical office building, the new jobs being created, and the world-class sporting facility that will be um, built in place of the subpar field of dreams. This is our personal bias looking out for the best interest of the community, and that, that is our job as leaders. In this case, the vocal minority has chosen to personally attack a single individual to support the cause, and that is saddening. What's even more frustrating is the fact that they can come up to the public forum and say anything that they want, including false information, and we as a council cannot respond. It's a convenient, one-sided pulpit. Personally, I have received more positive feedback in response to this project than negative, and with that being said, I strongly believe that this letter has no merit. I will hope uh, that you will vote in favor of filing it. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. And then Alderman Van Akron. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm uh, standing today in uh, an effort to refer this to the um, Committee of the Whole, which I believe is also our Ethics Committee. Um, I'm not standing here to substantiate any claims or refute any of the claims. Um, I am gonna stand to talk about the process. Um, when complaints like this come forward, which thankfully are very few and far between, we have a process in place and I think uh, it's our obligation and our responsibility to look into them, to openly look into them, have a transparent review of the complaints that are made in this process. Um, I do believe that we owe it to Mrs. Brache. I do believe we owe it to the public and I honestly believe we owe it to Alderman Hammond to have that opportunity to have this complaint reviewed openly and transparently and have some type of decision made on it. Again, I'm not standing here to substantiate any of these things. I certainly do not have any working knowledge of the claims that are being made, but we do have a process, and that process is to send complaints like this to the Committee of the Whole for review. So I do think it's our obligation and our duty and our responsibility to look into these matters. So I make the motion to send it to the um, 
That motion is out of order until we dispense with the motion on the floor, Alderman Van Akron. Am I correct? Excuse in me, Mr. City Mayor. Attorney? I don't believe. I think I can make well, a motion to refer. I haven't heard a second, but uh, I was just going to take a look at the, which takes precedence. But I believe referral does take precedence over. Final. I believe the referral does take precedence. A second. So I move to refer. I'll second it. I'll second it for discussion purposes. We're going to wait till the ruling by the city attorney. Section 2-191 says uh, motions in order during debate when a question is under debate by the council. No motion except the following shall be received. These motions shall have preference in the order in which they are arranged. Adjourned comes first, which is nice. Lay on the table, which is to file. Previous question, postpone to the next meeting, commit to a standing committee, commit to a select committee, amend or postpone indefinitely. So uh, I guess postpone indefinitely is is filing, uh, laying on the table is just tabling it to a subsequent meeting. But So as between referral to a standing committee, that would take precedence over or uh, postponing it indefinitely, which is filing it. So, so that, that would be uh, in order. Okay, so the motion to refer then, it takes precedence. We have a second from Alderman Boren, and we're under discussion on that motion. Go ahead, Alderman Boren. Thank you, Mayor. <coughs> uh, I just have a, a question on the procedure of the document coming in. Uh, I have a copy of it here, and in the second second paragraph, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Brash said, I would like to put into question what we consider to be unethical <coughs> conduct by Alderman Hammond and ask you to refer this document to the Sheboygan Common Council Ethics Board. Uh, my, my question is on procedure. Uh, when I saw this on the council agenda tonight, without a referral to the ethics board, uh, was it an oversight by somebody that they didn't see that Ms. Brosh requested that this be referred to the ethics board? It could have been on the agenda as a referral. It still could have ended up being filed. But I was, I'm just questioning the procedure of how this document came in and was not referred to a specific committee. It was left open. Whose decision was that? That was mine. And do you have a reason, reason for leaving it open? Just because I wanted to. I, it's my agenda to, to prepare, and that's what I decided to do. Next, is there any other discussion? Alderman Carlson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Because I'm not a big fan of having meetings just to have meetings, why don't we just have the discussion right now? The facts are simple. Alderman Hammond just read his four-page doc document explaining <coughs> the charges. Well, why not just have the conversation right now? We're all here. Attorney, the, uh, the council is the ethics committee, is that correct? Um, the ethics committee is uh, consists of all the members of the uh, all the aldermen and the chairman of the, the uh, committee of the whole serves as chairman of the ethics board. So a, as we sit here, this, this is not an ethics board meeting uh, because uh, Alder Person Donnie, who would be chairing it if it were, but uh, I, I think you need to kind of follow the procedure here. The, the motion is to refer it and address that before you start getting into the merits of things. Thank you, Alderman Donahue. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm going to vote against the uh, motion to refer. I think that we have <coughs> we have um, the complainant's complaint on its face. We've had a response from Alderman Hammond. I don't think that there are any particular additional facts that would be elicited at a committee of the whole or an ethics committee meeting. Public services <laughs> is not that easy these days. I understand um, that the neighbors uh, and other people in our community have serious concerns about the field of dreams being used by Aurora. 
I also understand that a number of people in our community have very positive feelings about it. That's the ball that we need to keep our eyes on because it is a very big deal for our community. There are good arguments on both sides of the issue. And what we need to do is to look at the economic impact, the quality of living impact, the impact to the neighbors, all of the issues that have been brought up. Those are the things that we need to look at. Now, on its face, and there's a concept in the law that says you can look at something and on its face, a prima facie case as to whether or not there is any claim that can be justiciable, that can be decided. And here, the, the main complaint is that uh, Alderman Hammond was on a plan giving committee that stopped uh, existing in 2009. I would just suggest on its face that that cannot possibly constitute a conflict of interest under section 19.85 of the Wisconsin statutes or our own ethics um, uh, ordinance. Making a contribution to any kind of charitable organization within our community is a donation to the good of the community. It is not a donation for the purpose of somehow several years later a project coming through and somehow the fact that a contribution has been made somehow upsets the charitable giving. It, I understand the emotion that's involved here and frankly I think all of us alder persons sitting here when we have people talking to us at the public hearing we we're feeling some emotion as well because it's not you know it's it's difficult to listen to people's really strong feelings and sometimes an older person could feel personally assailed by, you know, by things that are said, you know, that we're lying or being uh, somehow disreputable. I understand those emotions. I think that's part of what this quote ethics unquote complaint is about is people are just really angry and I'm not saying people should not be angry. What I'm saying is that we need to keep our eye on the prize here which is to determine after rational debate whether or not the zoning requests that are being uh, put forward by Aurora should be granted or should not. And I think we should have our debate, our focus needs to be on those issues. The complaint was filed. Alderman Hammond made a response. I really just don't think we need to take that any further. Now, if the motion to refer is defeated, we will still have a motion on the floor to file. And if older persons want to continue to have this conversation, they can vote against that motion to file. And if it's a majority, then we will have the ethics hearing and, 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 and we can do that. But I, I just strongly suggest to my fellow colleagues here that we, that we keep our eye on the prize, that we keep moving forward, we listen to the information, we look at the packets of information that are provided by constituents. We listen to all of our constituents, pro and con, and we move it forward in that respect. This is a distraction, and to this important issue, there should not be these kinds of distractions. Thank you for those comments. Alderman Dellinger. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, too, am going to vote against the, the referral, and I'm going to vote in favor of the of the filing of this document. Um, I would like to commend Alderman Hammond and his wife for their charitable contributions rather than condemn them. I feel that this does not rise to the level of an ethics violation and frankly is kind of a waste of the time that this body has and there's a lot of other things that we should be looking at rather than this, so thank you. Thank you for those comments. Alderman Van Akron. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, again, I'm gonna encourage us to refer this. My biggest concern, and I appreciate Alderman Hammond's comments and I applaud him for his comments, I really do. Um, again, I'm not here to talk about the merits of the complaint at all. Um, I think there's a forum for that and that is the Committee of the Whole and the Ethics Committee to discuss and review the complaints that are made, to receive legal advice from our city attorney and discuss if there is any merit to them. Again, 
I, I've heard Alderman Hammond's statement, but we also have a written complaint, and I don't think we can just ignore that. Um, my concern would be is that if we summarily dismiss this complaint um, without reviewing it, I think it, sh it really casts a shadow of doubt as to what's going on here at City Hall, and I think that would be part of the concern, and I don't want to see that in any way. Um, don't get me wrong, I'm not looking forward to having this um, ethics committee. I don't think anyone here is. I don't think anyone here takes any enjoyment or will enjoy um, you know, reviewing complaints about a colleague. That is certainly not something I'm looking forward to in any way, but I do think it's our obligation and our responsibility. Thank you. Alderman Carlson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is uh, quite frustrating. Um, if, in fact, you do support this going to the ex ethics committee, you are in my opinion, by default, penalizing someone for being charitable. And, and that's just crazy, in my opinion. There's a lot of charities that I donate to, the United Way is being one of them. Is that gonna prevent me from voting on a lot of things that, because we do, we do fund some of the United Way programs through HUD money. Is that gonna prevent me from voting in favor of these going forward? The, this claim, it, if you look at it, obviously it, the attorney, Mary Lynn Donahue back there, said it a lot more in legalese than I can do it. However, if you just look at this claim, you can just see that it's just completely baseless and based on emotion, kind of a last-ditch effort to attack, essentially, the point man of the group. As a council president, as with every council president before Alderman Hammond here, that president has been involved in development meetings. That's how government works. That's how business works. So if we want to stop that process, this body has to do that. But if we send this to the Ethics Committee, once again, you're penalizing someone just on the face value of donating to a charity back in 2000, or being part of a charitable committee back in 2009, and then giving some money to a Nick U, it's absurd. And then the rest of the claims about conducting secret meetings, well, first of all, they're not secret meetings. They're, they're meetings that happen in the course of normal development. You go to any city, town, village, board in the entire country, probably in the world, that's how business happens. We cannot, we, we cannot possibly bring a developer in front of this council here and have a development deal worked out from start to finish with the entire body. It's not practical. So I really hope we can move past this. And as Alderman Donnie, Alderwoman Donnie, who has said, we need to look at the finish line. And whether that finish line involves to feel the dreams being moved or if it doesn't. But that's what we need to focus on. This baseless claim is not what we need to be focusing on right now. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll on the motion to send this to the Ethics Committee? Okay, but wait a minute. And to clarify, the motion was to send it to Committee of the Whole. Those are two different committees. Then I'll do it to the Ethics Committee if I do it again. Okay. Is that correct then? I believe. The motion is sent it to the ethics board, correct? Which is the that was my that's the request, yep. and that's the uh, the appropriate committee if there's an ethics concern. Correct. Okay, is that, that cleared up? Yep. Okay. <clears throat> Would just qualify in that and say the ethics board is basically like the committee of the whole. The committee of the whole chairman is the chairman of the ethics board, and it's all the, all the aldermen. So it's same composition as as the committee goal. Okay. okay. Is the voting open? <clears throat> the voting is open to send to the ethics board. Thank you. <clears throat> one eye, 11 no's, and one abstention. Motion's <clears throat> defeated. Then we have the motion to uh, file this uh, communication on the floor again. Is there any other discussion on that motion to file? Alderman Heidemann. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'd like to uh, indicate to the crowd behind us that an uh, a vote to file this document has, has no bearing on whether or not any one of these aldermen are going to support or not support the, with that project. This is just taking care of this matter at this time, and again, that vote will come up at a later time. Thank you. Any other discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll to file?
Hang on. Okay. Ten eyes, two noes, one abstention. Sue. Motion passes. Sorry. Point of order. Can you make sure that it, the motion was by me and seconded by Ballinger? Yes, okay. I can. Thank you. Okay, the next item on the agenda is 5.2 that uh, RO will lie over. Uh, 5.3 through 5.10 will be referred to various committees. <coughs> Under resolutions, 6.1 is a resolution by Alderman Hammond, Bellinger, Carlson, Donahue, Koth, Heidemann, authorizing a transfer of appropriations in the 2015 budget, appropriations for New York Avenue and Lot 13, parking reconstruction and parking lot lights. Alderman Hammond. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, first, I'd uh, move to suspend the rules. Second. Is there any objection to suspension of the rules? Seeing none, please proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to put the resolution upon its passage. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll for passage? Thirteen ayes. Motion passes. Item six point. Two is a resolution by Alderman Hammond, Bellinger, Carlson, Donahue, Koth, Heidemann, entering into a contract with Vinton Construction for street improvement projects on South 32nd Street, New York Avenue, A Street, and parking lot 13. Alderman Hammond. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'd like to um, move to suspend the rules again. Second. Thank you for that motion on suspension. Is there any objection to suspension of the rules? Seeing none, please proceed. Um, thank you again. I'd move to put the resolution upon its passage. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Is there any discussion on the motion? Alderman Carlson. Thank you. I just wanted to comment on this uh, in case you aren't aware of this project. Um, part of this project is to reopen New York Ave, widen up 8th Street in front of the former Boston store, and redo some of the parking lots. And it's just a good positive thing for our downtown, and I'm looking forward to it. Thank you for those comments. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? <coughs> 13 ayes. Motion passes. Item 6.3 through 6.7 will be referred to various committees. Under reports of officers, 7.1 is an RC by law and licensing to whom is referred RO number. 236 of 1415 by the city clerk submitting various license applications and it recommends denying a taxi cab driver's license number 0665 based on her failure to accurately review all relevant convictions on her application, her record of violations related to the licensed activity, and her record as a repeat law violator and her failure to cooperate with the committee. Alderman Vanderweel. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that the RC be accepted and adopted. Second. Thank you for that motion and support under discussion. Is Michaela Garrison here this evening? She is not here. We did invite her to our committee on two separate occasions and she did not show up either time. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll for passage. Thirteen ayes. Motion passes. Seven point two is an RC by Public Works to whom is referred RO number two sixty one of fourteen fifteen by the city clerk submitting a communication from Timothy Halada requesting to have a fundraiser for the Sheboygan Area School, School District's Music and Arts Department at the Armory and recommends the request be approved. Alderman Heideman. Yeah. I put the motion uh, uh, upon uh, accept and adopt. Second. Resolution. Thank you for that motion and support. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll?
13 eyes. Motion passes. <clears throat> um, under ordinances, 8.1 and 8.2 will re be referred to the City Planning Commission. Under uh, nine um, matters laid over, 9.1 is resolution number 60 of 1415 by Alderman Hammond, Bellinger, Carlson, Donahue, and Koth, authorizing a transfer of appropriations in the 2015 budget, 2015 contracted services in the city attorney's office, 2015 sidewalk and, and mini storm sewer projects, and the A Street Bridge project. Alderman Hammond. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move to put the resolution upon its passage. Second. Thank you for the motion and support. That motion is before us. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Thirteen eyes. Motion passes. Next, we'll go on to other matters. City Attorney. Thank you, Your Honor. 10.1 is an RO by the purchasing agent submitting an evaluation of request for bid number 1802-15 for the purchase of two XL Hustler model X1 zero turn mowers and accessories and one XL Hustler model Super Z with backpack and accessories. That will be referred to the Public Works Committee. 10.2 is a resolution authorizing the purchasing agent to purchase replacement zero turn mowing equipment for the, for the uh, Motor Vehicle Department. Also referred to the Public Works Committee. 10.3 is an RO by the City Clerk submitting a petition to stop the rezoning of property located at 3306 <coughs> Salmon Avenue, Perrin Field of Dreams. That will lie over till April 8th. 10.4 is an RO by the City Clerk submitting a claim from Rachel Colbath for alleged injuries when she slipped and fell on ice crossing the street on Michigan Avenue. That will be referred to the Finance Committee. 10.5 is an RO by the City Clerk submitting various license applications for the period ending December 31, 2015 and June 30, 2016. That will be referred to the Law and Licensing Committee. Next is a closed session. Alderman Hammond. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move to convene in closed session under the exemption in Section 19851E Wisconsin Statutes for the purpose of discussion and formulation of negotiating strategies relative to the natural resource damage assessment where bargaining reasons require a closed session. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Uh, please call the roll. Mark? No. Thank you. <clears throat> 13 eyes. We'll take a short recess and reconvene in five minutes.